Good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to the regular Tuesday, July 7th uh, meeting of the Morro Bay uh, Planning Commission. Um, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, note that Commissioners uh, Luer, Sadowski, uh, Sorensen, and Teft are present. Uh, Commissioner Lucas is absent, so we do have a quorum, and uh, we'll proceed. Um, so we'll start the meeting, as is our usual custom, with a moment of silence. Thank you. And if you'll all rise and join us uh, in pledging allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and good evening. This is a time that we have set aside for Planning Commissioner announcements. Are there any, any comments or announcements from anyone this evening? No, we are a quiet group today. <laughs> Okay, Wait, well. Actually, there's a Wharf Tech meeting tomorrow uh, for the wastewater reclamation facility. Uh, tomorrow, I think it's at three o'clock at the community center. Very good, important, important project. Um, and I was just going to thank everybody for their hard work. It was a wonderful 4th of July celebration down on the waterfront, so. Very good, very good. So um, now it's uh, time for the public to have their say. Uh, this is a public comment period for any matters that are not on the agenda tonight. Uh, any uh, gripes or uh, issues that you'd like to bring to our attention, uh, please uh, uh, step forward, give us your name, and let's hear what you have to say. Okay, seeing none, we will proceed with our agenda uh, onto the consent calendar. Um, which this evening consists of the approval of minutes from our Planning Commission meetings of May 5th and May 19th, and uh, the current and advanced planning and processing list. Uh, any uh, corrections on the minutes or comments, questions about the advanced planning list? Just have a question for staff. You know, we're using these um, YouTube uh, tags. How long after these I think I might have brought this up before, but how long will these be available in, as YouTube tags uh, on these minutes? So in five years, will they be able to uh, still go back to these minutes and review a project? I know there's no time limitation at this point. I'd have to check back in with, you know, and find out though, a little bit more about it. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, and I'll, I will check. That's an interesting question. Okay, thanks. My question is when I go to watch the minutes on YouTube, how do I keep from being distracted by the dancing raccoons? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, is there a motion to approve the uh, consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Moved by Commissioner Sadowski and seconded by Commissioner Sorensen. Uh, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So a motion carries 4-0. Um, and we will move on to item B, our public hearing for the e this evening. We have only one on the agenda, and this is B1, which is a continued uh, hearing from our July 7th meeting due to some noticing issues. Uh, this has to do with a conditional use permit, uh, uh, UP0-409 at 2455 Greenwood Street. And I believe Ms. Joan is going to talk to us about this. Thank you, Chairman Teft. Um, and good evening, Commissioners. The item before you, again, uh, is a request for conditional use permit approval um, to allow an addition exceeding 25% of existing floor area for a single-family residence at 2455 Greenwood. Um, the residence has a, a non-conforming side yard setback. <laughs> is it on? 
Okay. We just have to turn it off. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Why not? There you go. Um, the property is located in the Del Mar neighborhood within the R1S2 single family uh, zoning district to the east of Highway 1, south of San Jacinto, and to the north of uh, Highway 41. This neighborhood is composed of modest one and two story homes of varying ages and architectural styles. Current requirements of the Mora Bay Municipal Code for setbacks and driveway width render the existing structure nonconforming. The required side yard setback for this parcel is three and a half feet. However, the setback um, along the northern property line is only 2.75 feet. Um, also, pursuant to uh, Mora Bay Municipal Code Section 17.44.030, the minimum driveway width is 10 feet, and currently the existing driveway is only 9 feet as it leads towards the rear of the house, towards the garage uh, at the rear of the lot. Um, it's important to note that the proposed driveway uh, is relocated and enlarged to be well within the, uh, the requirements. Um, and all new construction as well also uh, meets or exceeds all the zoning requirements. This is the existing site plan with uh, Greenwood Avenue um, to the east on the right of the, uh, of the image. You can see the 2.75 foot uh, setback up there at the, uh, the northern side um, and also the nine foot driveway to the south. This is the view from Greenwood looking, towards, uh, looking to the west towards the existing residence. The applicant um, proposes to, like I said before, relocate and enlarge the driveway um, and to add 1,112 square feet to an existing 1,039 square foot structure. Um, the, oh, before, I, before I move forward, I would also like to say that in the staff report, um, I apologize, I made a mistake in the exemption, in the CEQA exemption. Um, it is a, um, a class one section 15301 for in addition to an existing structure. Um, it is correct on your resolution, however. Let's see. So um, pursuant to municipal code section 17.56.160, um, uh, it requires the approval of a conditional use permit for projects um, for additions in excess of 25% of the existing floor area. And that approval requires that certain findings be made. First, that the addition is in compliance with all applicable provisions of the zoning ordinance, including setback and height. Uh, second, the applicant is required to submit a complete building permit application and obtain the, re uh, the required permit prior to construction. Third, the project is an allowed use within the R1 zone and is compatible with uh, surrounding neighborhood development of modest one and two story single family homes. And lastly, it is not feasible to make the structure conforming because major reconstruction would be necessary to meet the required side yard setback. Um, and where, um, you can see on the proposed site plan, where that 2.75 foot setback is, um, you'll see on the proposed floor plan, um, the kitchen uh, wall, the kitchen is remaining where it is. Um, let's see. So this is the main floor of the proposed house. Um, the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom, and the bathrooms are to remain in the same locations with the addition of a new dining and sewing room. The new garage has been built within the uh, setback requirements, so the conformity along that northern um, wall has been improved um, at that northern half of the uh, northern third of the house. Also, as a condition of approval, the architectural detail shown at the, um, at the southeast corner of the garage um, that extends into the front setback, it will be removed, ensuring that it will um, be uh, within the zoning requirements. So as a condition of approval, again, in the resolution, you'll see that little architectural extension at the, uh, that southeast corner of the garage is to be removed. Yes, ma'am. Would you go repeat what you just said about the architectural? Yeah, if I, I believe sometimes this, re oh, there it works. So see that little thing sticking out there, that little architectural detail 
that sticks out in the front. Um, it is encroaching um, a, a few inches into the setback, so it will be removed. It will be brought back to the front of the house um, to stay outside of that front yard setback. And to get the architectural detail that they were looking for, they're going to use um, either a different material or a different paint color or something else to achieve the look that they were going for. Thank you. Yeah. The um, proposed split level residence includes a new office and laundry room on the lower level at the rear of the home and a new master bedroom and bath on the upper level at the front of the home above the garage. The following elevations show the proposed single family residence as seen from the front and the rear. Um, please note that the entire building, including um, the architectural element that looks rather high in these renderings, um, will they, they shall adhere to the 25 foot height limit um, and a certificate of compliance will be required um, also as a condition of approval on the project. These are the north and south elevations that show the proposed residence from either side. Um, and staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve the project um, for the proposed addition of a nonconforming structure by adopting Planning Commission Resolution 21-15, subject to the findings and conditions of approval in the resolution. And uh, thank you. I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, John. Um, are there any questions for staff? We would just like to point out that in the plans, uh, Jerry has noticed that the proposed main level uh, is flipped. It should be a mirror. It's a mirror. It should be a mirror image. It shows the garage in the back of the building as opposed to front. I. No other changes. <laughs> On the the center section, they're not proposing any new living area where that's encroaching into the setback area, correct? I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part. Okay, in the um, in the where where the encroachment is into the side setback, they're they're using the existing structure, and, and they're not adding any new. Living area there. On correct. The okay. Yes, correct. The the kitchen um, is the only part that still butts out into into the setback. Here's the existing yeah. site plan. Is that whole northern wall? Um, so they're they're bringing the garage into conformance and leaving that kitchen wall. I just, the, it, they stated that. I just wanted to confirm that that was. A yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just I'm uh, I, gotta, I, I'm gonna, I, I want to go back to the sequel issue. I'm, uh, according to the description, the applicant proposes to add 1,112 square feet of habitable floor area to an existing 1,039 square foot residence, and the sequel exemption applies to additions to existing structures of less than 50 percent of existing floor area. So. I, if you could just clarify, I mean, that, on the face of it, it looks like that's more than 50%, so. It is. Um, it is section E2, um, I believe, is, is the proper exemption. It is 15301, and it is a class one. It's one line down. There was, there was some confusion as to what the proper exemption was. Thank you, sir. Um, it's an ad addition to an existing structure provided that the addition will not uh, result in an increase of more than 50% um, was the first one. The second, number two under that subset, is 10,000 square feet if, um, so that the addition will not result in an increase of more than 10,000 square feet if the project is in an area where all public services and facilities are available to allow for maximum development permissible in the general plan. Okay, so then we, we will need to amend the resolution at some point to reflect that, okay. Yes, sir. All right, that, that's less, can, less um, got my head spinning a little less. <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> my uh, apologies. Can, can I, uh, 
on that note, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any 10,000 square foot homes in that area, obviously. So um, is that an applicable uh, section for CEQA, or am I not reading it really? Maybe you can more clarity. No, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I, mean, I just would like to point out, we're, we're kind of discussing technicalities, uh, because as I recall, there's also an exemption for construction of a single family home. So the, the, correct. it's just finding the right section the, here. There is, correct. and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an up to 10,000 square feet if those other things are in place. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're not building 10,000 square foot homes. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, any further questions? Um, if not, uh, I'd like to open this up for public comment uh, uh, traditionally, and in this case, we would ask to hear first from the applicant or the applicant's representative if they're present this evening. Thank you, Chairman Taft, members of the commission. My name is Stephen Peck. I'm the applicant in this uh, matter. Um, we bought this house about 10 years ago, and uh, fortunately, we've sort of fallen in love with the neighborhood, and I tried to convince my wife that we could make our lives a lot easier by building new someplace else, but uh, she likes the area. We need something that is a little bigger for uh, for our needs, and so we started working with our, our architect uh, several years ago on a concept. We've come up with this one that we're very excited about. Um, I, I wish that the previous builder had built uh, the house about that much farther to the south, but he didn't, or she didn't, <clears throat> and so that's why we're here today. Uh, in the process of doing this, we've, I think we found that we're probably going to be removing more uh, impervious concrete, and, and we're going to be replacing that with pervious pavers. Uh, again, we're not subject to the LID requirements, but um, we should be doing that all along anyway. Uh, we're getting rid of the nine-foot uh, driveway that goes to the back, like a number of other houses on this side of the street. Our garage is in the backyard, ends up being storage rather than a garage, and so we tend to park our cars in that area. And so that nine-foot setback now is sort of going to get wrapped around to the front. We're going to have a legitimate 16-foot um, wide uh, driveway. <clears throat> All the other conditions that uh, the staff has recommended are, uh, are acceptable to us. Uh, the, the comment that Chairman Teft made about the environmental determination is uh, is not unimportant in the fact that I think this says that this project is also categorically exempt, whether it's up to 10,000 square feet, as long as we meet all your other standard codes and ordinances. The illustrations that uh, that are provided, uh, it might lead one to believe that this is going to be taller than the 25 feet. It will not be. We've discussed this with staff, and we'll provide the necessary assurances and certifications uh, by the uh, from our surveyor. We're excited to get started on the project. Uh, we like the neighborhood, as I mentioned. Uh, in December, we had sort of a community or a neighborhood meeting where we presented the idea, tried to get some feedback. I think we, uh, we had most of the people come to our house and didn't, didn't hear any detractors. Um, these things are, you know, swinging a hammer isn't, uh, isn't silent, so there will be some noise. And we're sensitive to the fact that uh, we need to be working within a certain time frame We've committed to our neighbors as well that uh, we'll be consulting with them on an ongoing basis to let them know of the, the times when we're going to be a little noisier than normal. There's going to be a lot of concrete removal and that sort of thing. So in the interest of being a good neighbor, we, I've advised my contractor to keep them advised of times when that will actually happen. Uh, as I said, this will be our home. It is our home. Don't want to make any enemies in the process. So. Um, Looking forward to working with staff further on this and uh, request your approval of it. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any, uh, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to the commission on this issue? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll ask if there are any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I live next door to Stephen. I live next door to Stephen and his wife, and they're both lovely people and have been great neighbors. Um, could, could we get your name? Carla Friedman. Thank you. We live so close that we share a driveway. Um, and I'm essentially going to be using this opportunity 
to make changes in my life and move because there's no way in heck I'm going to live through this. And nothing against the project. If, you know, as long as it's within um, code, you know, with the neighborhood, I'm absolutely fine with them creating their dream home. Um, so I'm just using it as a parameter for my own life in terms of when I'm going to make changes. And, you know, the getting of permits and all of that is an unknown, you know, bureaucracy is a slow process. So that's really just the thing for me is, you know, getting a sense of timing and figuring out when and where and having the financial ability to make that gigantic move because neither my cat nor I would live through it, you know, but yay, progress. <laughs> it happens. So that's pretty much it, you know, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more members of the public present, uh, we will bring it back to commission. I'll ask if there are any questions for the applicant uh, at this point. I'd just like to comment. Sure. Um, I think what you did is like neighborhood compatibility in the making, in the way, in practice. And I really appreciate that you're taking a proactive approach for the pavers, even though it's not required. And you as a neighbor, I wish you best, you know, on your findings, you know, for a new place. But um, I, 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 um, I really appreciate you going out and doing that. Thanks. Okay. No questions, uh, comments? I actually really like this project. I think uh, it be, will be good for the neighborhood. Um, yes, there will be some short-term um, disruption, but it's um, a lovely home. I think you've made some good decisions. I also like the, um, how there's on the sides some high and some low, some variation. It gives interest to the project, and um, I liked it. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll second, I'll echo that. I'll echo, can, my microphone's on, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll echo those comments. Um, I, I appreciate the, the effort you went into creating a good, you know, a good quality design. And uh, this, once again, this is what we were trying to bring about with our design guidelines was to to get you know interesting quality projects um, in these tough tough lots this is a small lot it's a it's a sizable uh, you know addition and I think you've uh, articulated it and and uh, you know adjusted the massing uh, as best as best you can on it so um, once again this is what we were trying to have Type, the type of projects we were trying to bring forward with our design guidelines. So I commend you and the architects on, on the effort. Richard? Yes, I, um, I too um, especially like the, um, the roof line dimension in giving it that um, not a rectangle box look, <laughs> you know. So, but, and it is a tough, um, it was a challenging uh, architectural design, so I, I do also uh, like it. Okay. Um, well, I have to I have to echo those comments. Um, I um, I especially honestly like that architectural detail, the 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 the, the, the sort of vertical face there next to the garage. I think that adds a lot of interest, and in, I would really encourage staff to continue to work with the applicant to preserve that as much as possible. Um, I, this project does bring up uh, one issue that I, I think we, we kind of need to have in our minds um, for future reference. Uh, because this is a project that where there is really an extensive reconstruction of this house going on. And the question then becomes, the question that that raises in my mind is, at what point does it then become not 
an excessive burden to go ahead and remove the 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 incompatibility, remove the remove the 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 the, the, the issue with the project that is not in conformance with code. Um, I, you know, I, I, I bring that up because I, I think we're going to see more and more situations where that becomes a consideration. Uh, to me, I, you know, I went out and looked at the project, looked at the house next door, looked at the distance between them, looked at the neighborhood, and to me, uh, trying to eliminate this, I think, 10 inches of, uh, uh, of encroachment into the lateral uh, setback, um, is it just doesn't seem very important to me. So I, I, to me, in my judgment, it doesn't it doesn't really apply in this situation. I just want to I just want to bring that up as um, you know a consideration that may come up with 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 future uh, 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 issues. Um, I was a little concerned about the rem removing half of the, there's a shared driveway with the house next door and half of that's going to go away at least. I, I, I'm not sure exactly where the property line is, but you know, then I looked at the house next door and I realized that the garage door is no wider than her side of the driveway. So it shouldn't, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, they, they kind of line up with each other. So I'm uh, really willing to support it. I'm willing to support the design and I, I would like to see whatever can be done. To, uh, you know, it's not real often that we have projects come before us where you say, what is that? And you and the person, the, the, the response is, well, we, we did that because we like the way it looks, you know? <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, so so I, I would, I'd like to see that, um, uh, see, see the city do what we can to, to, to let that happen. Um, but I'm certainly willing to support the project and to entertain a motion for um, approval. Sounds like we're pretty unanimous on this. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just may I comment on your comments? Of course. <laughs> okay, um, I agree with you on the on the what point do we need to rectify these encroachments? And um, but I, you know, this was ten inches, you know, right. nine inches, and so I didn't think for, it was a real yeah for, for real a, critical, and it's only no. for a short section of the wall. So, um, but we are going to see. You know there are a lot of in, a lot of problems that were not intentional. You know these areas here, here and up in um, up in the the Ridgeway Ridgeway uh, site, and then down in the in the beach track, um, there were some really bad surveys done mm -hmm. in the 30s, and so the surveyors were actually going from bad monument placements. So. If you if you look at if you look at lines of fences, you can see them zigzag down the property lines according to where the latest monuments were set. So, so this wasn't try, somebody trying to get away with something. They were they were building it at the best of their ability at the time. So, we yeah. just have to be cognitive of that fact. Yeah, I I, I certainly appreciate that. I, I I imagine especially on some of those hillsides that surveying with the equipment they had back then was quite a challenge. Um, yeah, one one of the things that you didn't mention, it's like, uh, how far do you want to go before it's like a total teardown? And I want to maybe bring it to staff. Do you guys, when you get something, is do you kind of nip it in the bud? Like if it's glaringly obvious that the guy is just going to like, I'm going to keep the chimney here and then just build a house around it kind of thing. Well, I think a scenario where you're tearing the whole thing down and trying to keep the one corner would probably be an issue that we would bring forward to the planning commission. Um, I don't necessarily think this is the situation that you find with this project, um, and it's and it's and you're right, it's not a, a conversation that we've had on a larger scale. Like, hey, when do we cut this off? You can add on to a non-conforming structure 50 percent of the existing square footage. We don't have a policy like that. I, I just pulled that out of the air as an example. So that's not something that we've had a discussion about. It might be something worth having a discussion about in the future, um, but certainly that's not what the city's looked to in the past, and we don't have a practice of that that I've seen. Right. So your, your point's, I mean, well taken that it might be worth having a conversation about. But I think that's one of the reasons why additions to nonconforming structures need to come before the Planning Commission is because there, uh, at some at some point, there's a, there are value judgments to be made here. There there's weighing of benefit versus cost, and and 
I think in this case, the scales are not very close to being even. Uh, you know, the, the, the benefits would be relatively minimal, but that may not always be the case. <laughs> Are we ready for a motion? Absolutely. Okay. If. Let me give this one a try. Um, I move that we accept uh, resolution number PC21-15 with uh, the appropriate change to the to credit the, the correct CEQA um, uh, condition finding. I second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Then let's call for a roll call. Commissioner Sadowski? Aye. Commissioner Lohr? Yes. Commissioner Sorensen? Aye. And Chairman Teft? Aye. Congratulations and good luck with your project. Okay. Moving on to unfinished business, we're returning to a topic that uh, arose with regard to one of the waterfront developments that we reviewed previously, and that has to do with uh, interpretation of uh, code language regarding the requirement for lateral access in Bayside uh, projects. And I think uh, uh, probably Scott's going to sit in for Cindy on this one, since I see Joan's making her uh, escape. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm taking this one, like you said, for Cindy. We'll see if we can. Okay, so as was stated, this was uh, you know a discussion of Bayside lateral access. It was sort of brought forward as a result of the of the Fowler project that you saw two meetings ago. Um, we had the issue for that we couldn't initially remember, uh, right. <laughs> uh, related to the, the lateral access. And then we had the, uh, the vertical view access out to the, um, out, out to, towards the, uh, to the west um, that we took through at the last meeting for an interpretation. So we had those two that, you know, those two interpretations that, um, that the Planning Commission requested that we bring forward. Um, so here we are, you know, now with the Bayside lateral access piece. Um, you do have uh, handouts that, uh, that share Teft. Um, provided to you, I think and we I forwarded them via email to you, and then you have hard copies there. One of them is citing relative, relevant code sections to the issue, and the other is commentary um, that I would assume uh, Chair Teff is going to make as we move forward. I think you just thought it would be nice if you had it ahead of time. So um, you have those documents, and then kind of hopping into the discussion. Um, we have lateral access is defined by the Morrill Bay Municipal Code um, as uh, lateral access means public access along and parallel to the shoreline and coastal bluffs through the use of but not limited to pedestrian trails and boardwalks. Um, lateral access is required when uh, the provisions for, for continual lateral access pursuant to this section along the bayfront portion of the partial um, shall be required for any development or improvement which results in change in use. Uh, additional floor area or improvements, uh, increase in height, and uh, in addition of new significant um, non-attached structures or sort of like accessory structures is when it would trigger the requirement to look at that lateral access and potentially implement lateral access or require lateral access. Um, it's achieved through the use of walkways, um, that are at least eight feet wide. I think you're all aware now that the Coastal Commission is preferring the 10 foot walkways, so more often than not, you're going to see them be 10 feet, um, so as so applicants don't get their projects um, delayed as a result of having a, a policies inconsistent or setbacks, setbacks, walkway widths inconsistent with what the Coastal Commission desire, desires now, even though it is not um, called out as 10 feet in the city's LCP. Um, then also lateral access is achieved by um, use of decking and boardwalks and through breezeways and walkways. Those sometimes can be enclosed as long as they're unobstructed or can be covered, again, as long as they're not obstructed. But those are optional ways to provide that lateral access. Um, there's the uh, exception clause um, to this. And it says the lateral access requirements specified in the subsection A of this section may be waived in the following situations. Um, and that's uh, 
when the applicant demonstrates through an engineering analysis that it's infeasible. Um, when you have uh, lateral access that is infeasible uh, due to topographical or site constraints, there's a requirement that uh, the applicant pay in lieu fees in an amount equal to what it would cost to provide that lateral access if it were feasible. Um, that's probably an interesting analysis. <laughs> um, and then uh, for coastal uh, dependent development, uh, where provisions of uh, uh, continuous lateral access would conflict with, sorry, wrong slide, um, the day-to-day -day operations or use of uh, those coastal dependent resources, um, then we can move the lateral access inland or away from the area where it would be conflicting with the day-to-day -day operations of, say, the fishing fleet um, as they load and unload or process uh, fish resources from the ocean. Um, there's uh, LCP policy 120 that also talks about these exceptions. Um, the reason I'm sort of focusing on the exceptions at the end of this is because this is uh, the reason why we didn't come forward with a resolution for you for adoption today. I wanted to have a discussion because when we read through the policies, this is, yep, you're supposed to have lateral access, except when you can't have lateral access. And so I wasn't exactly sure where you wanted us to focus our resolution here, and so that's why I wanted to have the... Um, this conversation today without having the resolution pre you know, brought forward. Um, we will bring it back at a, at a future time if we get clear direction or as we get clear direction. The, the questions that we're looking to answer is, you know, how do we reconcile the you're required to have it with there are exceptions? When do we use them? How do we use them? Uh, when is it appropriate? And under what circumstances um, do we utilize those, and what are we expecting, you know, along with those types of things? And what kind of studies maybe you're looking to to achieve to, to verify those things? Those are some things I haven't seen, and I didn't see related to the overall, the uh, the project that came forward with Fowler. Fowler was one piece of three leaseholders that held that entire area, so that was approved all as as one original permit, and then amended over time many, many times. Um, again, I think I mentioned when we went through that process that it was something that I wouldn't uh, encourage happening again or support, really, because it ends up, at the end, you kind of have confetti. You have all these separate projects, and it came forward, and the decision when it was going through to place lateral access down on floating docks made sense if you looked at it and said, hey, we can't get through Dynagy, so you said, hey, it's not feasible. We can't go through there because we don't have access to that property. And so we're going to put it down there. But then they never connected it even on beyond it to the Fowler site. So when you saw it for that piece, you went, wait a second, it doesn't connect. And it didn't. So it's sort of, I could see why they went there when I pulled back and looked at the overall project. But they still didn't make it on the other end. There should have, at a minimum, been a gangway so they could say, well, yeah, you can get behind it, but you couldn't. And I think the Planning Commission, rightly, rightfully so, at that, at that juncture said, hey, you can provide it right along the back, and that's how, you, that's how the, con the commission conditioned that project. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. If you have questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, let's have a discussion and uh, see what, and if I can't get some direction to bring back a, an interpretation resolution. Questions? Okay. Yeah, I know. We all have you know, strong input on this one, I'm sure. Um, do we, uh, Scott, for a question, I have not seen any mapping of what the, the terminus on the south end and the north end of this is going to be or how. So does... You know, I think the Embarcadero plan, I think, was, was kind of envisioned, to, you know, to go pretty much to the state park. Are we, are we, talking, are we talking that, or are we talking just on the... Well, well it, it talks about la lateral access, and the, and the idea is that it's encouraged all along the Embarcadero. Okay? Yeah. Now, there are areas where there are, uh, you know, fishing-related... Uh, it, there, where there are booms that offload, you know, product from the ships, where you probably don't want them, you know, people, you want to direct people right adjacent to that because it would be, it would be closed off all the time as a result of it. Um, so you would probably have the access be behind that and you'd be able to walk behind it. And all that's in your way is those booms. You can see right out to the ocean. So your visual access still exists there. So moving it back a little way is probably not a huge issue in those areas. Um, I think you've got to pay a lot more attention when it's a building that's in your way. Yeah. 
what is the physical constraint? I mean, yeah, you can have two lesates that are next to each other, and one of them's up here and one of them's down here. That would be a physical constraint. But, you know, are there things that you can do to get it closer, at least for the future? Like, hey, we see that we have four feet of difference, and you can't get a ramp that meets the ADA requirements in between there, so they can't fix it right now. But if they were to raise this up a little bit, and then that other one, when it redevelops, was to lower it down a little bit, now we're, we're meeting. And so in the future, we could, when that lease site redevelops, make that connection. Um, I think those are the types of, of studies we'd be interested in seeing um, when those situations arise where they say, hey, it's infeasible to connect because of a topographic issue. Um, other constraints that you have um, relate to you know, where those connections would be made, whether they're out, because a lot of the connections actually extend out over the bay. <clears throat> and if they're shading eelgrass, it's not going to be allowed. So you can see where the lateral access in many of those areas where eelgrass exists um, is going to be limited how far they can extend out, if at all, beyond um, the riprap that runs along the edge of the, the harbor. So, but don't the, <laughs> doesn't the 75% translucent uh, docking, uh, dock material mitigate that? Um, they've come out with yeah. new requirements, um, and there's a five meter buffer. Yeah. No, so the idea is no impact. The eelgrass has, re, has been reduced so much in the bay um, y, 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 that it's that it's critical to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And so the resource agencies, along with the Coastal Commission, have come out with new requirements. One of those is the five meter buffer from any any yeah. eelgrass patch. And so you can't have the graded anything over it or the see through anything over it. They're not they're not allowing that to take place. They're not allowing shading. To, to get back to my first question, you know, was. I was kind of, I was wondering, are, are we going to be including uh, like the Beacon Fuel Dock uh, down, down on the south end or the Martini property there where there are leaseholds and even down, you know, basically down to the Inamora Bay where there are leaseholds out there? Uh, is that going to be connected up to the, to the Embarcadero walkway? Have there been plans or projections to do that? It includes language to do it. Our, the LCP and the waterfront master plan include language to provide the connection along the, along the waterfront. Um, it does realize that some of those areas it's not appropriate um, and then gives you these alternatives. Why there's, there's why there's alternatives, because there are certain places you definitely don't want people you know, right on the very edge of the wharf, say, walking along there, if you have booms and things like that, where th stuff's unloading and they're, and they're processing things and whatnot. And aren't, aren't most of the policies re related to the waterfront, and, and I think even the waterfront master plan, applicable to what they call the Embarcadero area, which basically goes down to Tidelands Park, and then the rock area, which is from Beach Street up, yes. up to the rock, I think. That's correct. You know, and, and other, they're, they're, they're under... They're, they're under sections in the uh, Coastal Land Use Plan and, and in the zoning ordinance that apply to those sections as defined in the, the land use map. But this also is a Coastal Commission requirement, too. Uh, and those, those are commercial, commercial designated areas and... Uh, we, we have generalized, um, you know, access requirements that, that run throughout the various right. areas. Yeah. I mean, that's what uh, that's what Church F was, I think, referring to. That you know, you it's bro the city's broken up into different areas, right? And they have ac each of those areas you know, has an access component to it that references, you know, potentially how you're supposed to have access along the waterfront in those areas. It's not as specific as the waterfront master plan, though, or the policies that relate to the um, the Embarcadero area. Those are very specific. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the things that I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time on docks, you know, and starting, you know, starting down in San Diego, you know, back in the Finger Pier days, you had public access on, on major working docks, major, you know, where, where you had large, large fishing vessels, you know, down, you know, even down into, you know, the, uh, where you had some of the Navy vessels and some of the, the cruise ships coming in, you know, all the way up through, you know, to Oxnard and Channel Islands and you, and then through Santa Barbara, through the boat yards and through the fish processing plants uh, in Santa Barbara. And there is, in each of those instances, you have working marine facilities 
with public access. And it's, it's compatible and mitigated with just a little care and attention and, and mm -hmm. at worst case, you know, portable, you know, portable st stanchions that just say, you know, with a, with a rope line. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, I, what I'm really concerned about with these exceptions is using the using these exceptions for to not build the facility, not build the structure for a, for a, uh, an activity that may only last maybe a half an hour, forty five minutes out of a day, and where it could easily be mitigated. And I think that's and we've seen this, you know, we've seen this before come before the commission time and time again, especially with you know certain properties. And uh, so I, w I would like to see these, you know, as far as our res resolution, to have this narrowed down as far as possible so that we don't get these excep exceptions to be used to uh, as more as a political football rather than a, <laughs> than a technological or a feasible, actual engineering feasible you know, result or problem. So I guess that's... I'd like to hear what everybody else has to say about it. I agree with you. I also think that we have to be really careful that it's not an architectural reason not to build, you know, lateral access, that it's truly engineering. And I, I think there's probably, you know, because they'll come down to cost. And I think that that's one point where we can't waver. I mean, I think it's very clear that we need lateral access and to use architecture or design as um, a way to, say, give an exemption, I think we have to be real careful in that it has to be specifically an engineering reason that it can't be done. And I think that's a much higher bar. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I, I also agree with you, what you're saying, and, and you, um, Harry. My my thing is with with this lateral axis, we we have to take from a planning commission. We have to step back. A developer, when they look on their project, they just see the boundaries, but we have to look at the project how it going to integrate to the vision that we see the city the city going toward. That's another reason why it's like so important to have like we're all on the same page with the same vision. The details might be different, but that's what we should be looking at, you know, how it's going to all integrate. And the little, um, sometimes the, the developer has a myopic view of their, their uh, client or whatever, their project. And I think that the city, we also have a responsibility not only to the Coastal Commission to take their advice or their um, recommendations seriously, but also the State Lands Commission because of the Thai Lands Trust Grant. We have that responsibility. So it's a, a double hit as a city. I, uh, I also, uh, I lived on a boat in Marina de Rey for about four years, in early years ago, and, and I agree with you that, that there's like watching, oh yeah, you have work here, you do this. But we are a smaller spot, so we don't want to just start doing little cubicles either. We have a, it's a, some, sometimes being smaller is more challenging, even you know. And um, one of the projects that I do not want this kind of mentality is I, I was involved in a project in Cayucas where they were building a house on the creek, and then part of the mitigation was, oh, we'll build a bike path. And so they built this bike path, and it was just like, it was like a 50-yard dash. Just whoop, whoop. You know, they're not connecting to anything, you know what I mean, on Ashkey, yes. you know what I mean? And so when we look at these things, you know, it should be with a vision that we're going to integrate. You know, it's okay, build the five, bad bike path, but have like at least a vision where we're going to go, or the same thing with this. And I, I, um, I... I think that's about all my notes for now. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I, I, I especially what you were just saying, Richard, that it's important to keep in mind. I, I keep in mind with the big picture. And I think the, it, when you look at all of the different 
things that are all of the different sections of local code that have been written about this, and there's actually quite a bit. It's very clear that the, the, the city's vision at the time was to have a continuous bayfront access from at least Tidelands Park to the Rock. Uh, and I think that the city's actions in, in, in building the boardwalk uh, that, that, that currently exists uh, in the north part of the Embarcadero area is further evidence that that's what the city's vision is. So I think as whenever we interpret these specific things, the, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of in, in terms of, uh, uh, so, you know, and in, in, uh, in a number of places, uh, with regard to individual uh, projects, uh, it, it's, it states that there must be continuous access or access along the entire width of the property. And that's sort of obviously the only way to have a continuous access eventually is to have, uh, have, it, be, have it be continuous at each site. Um, there, there are certain exceptions, and I, I, you know, when it's, I was kind of surprised when I read the code carefully that there's, there's different solutions for these exceptions. Uh, the, the, the two exceptions where, um, uh, you, you, according to code, where you just don't have, you don't have access, is when it's physically not possible to build it, uh, uh, and. The word they use is infeasible, but I, you know, it, it makes it clear in different sections of the code that infeasible means there is no design option which can provide for lateral access. It's not we can't provide lateral access with this design. You, if the answer, if that's the issue, the answer is change your design. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's that's very clear uh, from the code. With regard to coastal dependent uses and commercial fishing uses, um, the solution that, as I read the code, is 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 different. N number one, I'm not sure which which way you were going with your comments, Jerry. Whether you were saying that that the access should not be a reason not to establish commercial uses, or commercial uses should be. Um, Clearly, commercial uses have priority. I mean, that's n not only the Coastal Act, but that's um, Measure D uh, as well. Uh, the solution for, but, but, and the solution for coastal dependent uses and public access is exactly what you said. The, the, you don't, you, you may not be able to do access along the bay, okay? But this is a working harbor. You know, people might like to know what it looks like when you're unloading slime eels, you know, or crabs or oysters or whatever. And so the solution is to, to, to make the public access, you know, as, as, number one, as great as possible, and number two, adjacent to these fishing uses. And I think you're, we have many examples right now of where public access and commercial uses coexist. It, co it, it coexists at uh, uh, Tognazini's uh, uh, spot. It, 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 it coalesces. It co it, they coexist at Giovanni's spot. Um, uh, so I don't see them as being at all inconsistent with one another. Um, I think. Uh, one thing that one thing one I think fault with the project that was approved that you were discussing is that it did not recognize the fact that continuous lateral access has to be provided along the bayfront portion of the parcel. They were providing lateral access on completely different parcels than what they were the leaseholders on. They were providing it on the waterside parcels, which they really have no control over. And so that access could go away at any time. Uh, so I think it's important that the access has to be on the site where the project is. It can't be somewhere else off in the, off in the water. Um, I, think, um, I think also uh, our current um, codes are very clear that lateral access has to be designed with an eye to connecting it to adjacent accesses. It, it, that's, that's just there in the code. It's, it seems it's something that has not been, not received a lot of attention, but it's like you, you have to show us not only what your lateral access is, but how that's going to work with adjacent accesses. And I think this is 
I, I just say, I think this may be particularly important uh, with regard to tying together some of the street end viewing platforms to the lateral access that exists on either side of it to make truly a, a continuous um, uh, uh, access. Um, the other thing um, in terms of um, handicapped accessible, it, it, it's true, it may, you know, if you've got, I mean, there are now uh, recently some lateral access areas down on the embarked door that have steps. Uh, that go up and down from one to the other. And obviously that's not handicap accessible in a lateral uh, way, but they, those are handicap accessible from the Embarcadero. So, so uh, it's not, clearly it's desirable to have the lateral access way be handicap accessible all the way down. Uh, if, if that's not possible, the code provides an alternative for that, which is you have to have handicap accessible access from the Embarcadero. The other thing that I the other thing that I think we have to pay attention to is when they talk about the different types of access that can be pre, pre, be provided the the the, bree, the breezeways the decks the walkways every single one of those uses the phrase open and unobstructed okay and I think that's going to be an issue in terms of approval and in terms of uh, enforcement uh, because there are situations now where uh, what is ostensibly lateral access is filled up with tables uh, and ch and chairs and people serving beer uh, and that's not i don't think the meaning of uh, open and unobstructed lateral access so i think open and unobstructed is a is a is a key phrase um and the only other thing I think, the, I'll, I'll shut up, but the, but the only the other thing I think needs to be clarified is, um, and I think this is just an oversight, the, the, all of the lateral, the lateral access provisions that we have now don't make a distinction between land side and water side sites. There, there are some sites that are basically leased out for the purpose, they're, they're water, they're submerged, they're underwater, um, they're leased out for the purpose of providing docks and, and uh, facilities for boats. And I think it's, I think we just should say obviously that the, the lateral access provisions don't apply to lots that are, the waterside lots, the ones that are underwater. Well, if I wasn't clear, <laughs> which I probably am not very, quite often, but uh, let me just clarify that the yes, Marine activity and the economic feasibility of marine activity is paramount, and so that you know, so what we're trying to, the essence of Morro Bay is a working harbor, and that's what we need. That is our, that is our economical, our economic cornerstone, and that's why most of us live here. It's because it's a working harbor. And we have all the advantages and all the activities that, you know, that that entails. So, to, you know, if we've got lateral access, to provide the lateral access, if that lateral access is blocked off temporarily, and I'm, during the activity that would, that would create a hazard, I see that is, you know, that should be feasible. I mean, that should be allowable, and I see that. But that's not with a with an iron gate. That's not closed 364 days out of the year. That's while the activity is in progress 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. And you see this in working harbor harbor fronts up and down the coast, and it works works fine. And this is part of the draw of Morro Bay. This is what what makes it unique. And, and people, and that's what, um, they can buy a t-shirt anywhere, but they can't see a boat unloading. They can't see a haul out. You know, they can't see the bottom of a, uh, yeah, you know, the, you know, a boat coming out of the water. They don't know what the boats look like underneath, you know, and, and that's, that's what draws people here towards Morro Bay and seeing the fishing activity and seeing, See, seeing that whole lifestyle, that's, that's what we have to sell. And we're spiting ourselves if we don't protect that and we don't allow that. 
Yeah, that's spot on. I think that's important. And uh, we, um, and another thing that I would like to also say is I think that we should, in, a, in our vision, be proactive. If, the C, if our LCP says eight feet and, and the CCC is pushing 10, we should start looking at 10. You know, let's start looking and let's go for, let's push it, you know. Well, I'd just like to go back to to what Jerry said. I would, honestly, I'd go a, like a half step further and, and say that, you know, that, yeah, there may be some marine activities where it's not, that render it, in, that render it dangerous or infeasible or, you know, there may be some marine activities where they can't work over a 10 foot, you know, public access deck. Um, that's not a reason not to establish those those activities. It's a reason to provide the alternative public access that the code currently requires. Mm -hmm. It could be a rooftop deck. It could be a lot of different other things that they would be able to still enjoy watching it, but not, you know, public safety and not hinder the operations. Well, part of what, excuse me, I'm going to jump right in again. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Part of what, what the vision was, and you, you see it in the codes, is the word continuous. Where, you know, the, I, one of the best things that Morro Bay has, has done in the 40 years I've been here is the boardwalk out to the rock. That changed it from being a, a dangerous walk on a two-lane street to having to having strollers not literal strollers, but, you know, uh, walkers up, up and down, you know, that boardwalk. And it's amazing how many, you know, it's 6 o'clock in the morning or, or, you know, 5.30 in the afternoon, how many people are out there connecting. And, you know, the vision was to have that continuous through town from, from the rock to... You know, I would like to, you know, as far as we can go, you know, to the state park would be, would be the ideal. There's going to be some, you know, some engineering problems along there. But from the rock to the state park, I think, is the vision. So, you know, and to have it disjointed in one spot it really destroys, d destroys it. So, so if that means that a structure has to be removed to allow that access... Even if it's an existing structure, I th think it should be clearly stated that th that structure needs to be to be reduced to allow the access to have the safe access. Well, and, and uh, the other thing that I, the other sort of thing I you know if you I walk on the market a lot, my dogs like it, they get cookies. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the the thing that I notice is we have there's some there is some beautiful uh, spacious uh, areas of, of lateral access uh, uh, along the Embarcadero. But when, but when you walk along the Embarcadero, the, the the sidewalk, which is in front of the buildings where you can't see the ocean at all, is four times as crowded as the lateral access areas. And the reason for that is people don't know how to get from one to another. It's not obvious. It, what I would like to say, you know, and, you know, it's, it, this is not simply a conceptual problem. It's an economic problem. The businesses that are on the water side are struggling, a lot of them, because they just don't have the foot traffic, you know. And so it, it's not only, you know, there, there's, it's not a vision which is, just came out of nowhere. You know, uh, 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 an effective lateral bayfront access would be a, a significant improvement in the function of the Embarcadero, uh, Embarcadero area. Um, uh, and that's why I, I you know, in, in addition to, you know, these, these sort of interpretation things, I would really encourage the city to look at how we can extend this boardwalk concept uh, Get the get the street ends connected with the private access, and really, you know, move forward with making it um, a true. You know, there's areas where it would be so really quite easy. Um, 
Um, I, I'm just thinking, you know, the 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 area or up around um, the dockside developments. Uh, okay, the boardwalk there kind of runs in front of the buildings. Okay, and yet here's all of this marine activity and beautiful views of the rock behind that. Okay, now I get. I get, you know, they're also loading fish trucks there, you know, which probably would not, treks probably wouldn't last very long if you put it on that side of, you know, but simply scoring the asphalt and painting it like brick, you know, or painting it like wood would bring people back along that side for for almost no money, you know. I mean, there, there are ways to look at creative solutions to improving this access. Um, that, that would not require multi-million dollar grants from the state. Yeah, I, 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 like, I like what you just said also. It's like when you're walking on, you don't want to make yourself feel like your lateral axis, like you're walking in between a restaurant outside with the tables. It's got to be a pretty, where, where people can feel comfortable they're not intruding. And I, you know, they just painted some green bike markers over there by that, where the bike route by the high school there, you know? So, you know, I'm not saying that green, but I was just saying you know, some, something in that, like, kind of designation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just, I mean, I was just in, I'm sorry, for three, but I was just in, a, we, were, we were in Arroyo Grande this weekend. And what they've done in Arroyo Grande is they just took and made grooves at some of the intersections, made grooves in the concrete to make it look like brick, and they painted it kind of sand color. And it really defines where the crosswalk is. It's, it, it, the, the difference for, well, they spent probably a couple hundred dollars to do this, you know, and the, the difference is pretty dramatic, you know. And the other thing I think is once we get truly committed to this lateral access, the, then developers are not going to go, oh, we have to put in lateral access. They're going to go, we got to get in lateral access so we can get in on that action that's happening on that side, you know. In addition, behind Dockside, if you just continue on up to the Coast Guard station and just take it all the way through, it's a lovely walk. And back, you know. to, back, to, back and connect it to the existing boardwalk. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, I don't think our problem is as much, you know, in Measure D area as it is from, from the fuel dock south making those connections. So that's from Beach Street South, because there's a lot of open area up in, you know, in the, in the Measure D area north, from Beach Street North, you have a lot of open area that, 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 that has good view areas, but it's that, that non-interconnectivity from, from uh, Beach, I'm pretty sure that's Beach Street, one that comes down the hill, yeah. Beach Street South, Starting, starting actually starting there at the fuel dock, and making the connections through there, that's that's critical because it is so stop and start mm -hmm. that it there isn't a promenade, and that's that's where we need to have the vision too. But but there but there are also a lot of leases in that area that are coming up for renewal right. in in exactly. the near future. So this is a very, very good time to be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely the case. I mean, we were, they're kind of lining up out there. You're going to be seeing these consistently for probably the next year and a half. So, um, Scott, I, I got a question for you. You know, I was watching some of the harbor meetings, and you... I assume you integrate. Obviously, you you have to have dialogue with the harbor, you know, at times, you know, and because I this is not on the lateral axis, but there's certain issues like water and stuff that I'm not thinking that they're getting the severity of our issue here in in the state. But um, is this something that you regarding this? lateral access thing this is something that you you can you'll be bringing to them 
Is that right? Or well, the the latter access policies relate to the um, you know the development that comes before the planning commission. It really it really it really lives here, and we're trying to solidify what that means so we don't run into the situation where we ran into with Fowler. I don't. I, <laughs> you, you literally looked at the plan. And you're like, well, you can connect right here. It doesn't connect. Why aren't we connecting? Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, that, I mean that, wasn't, that wasn't tough. That was just looking at the plan going, it doesn't go over there. You're supposed to. I don't know what the finding was made before where they said it was infeasible, but we can make it feasible here. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that was, that, was, that was not rocket science making that happen. That was just like looking at the plan and going, you can just get right there here. There's not an issue. Um, so uh, I, obviously the commission is dialed into this. And so... I mean, looking forward to it, you know, in trying to create the interpretation memo, um, most of the things we're talking about relate to the policies that are in there and exist. Mm-hmm. Well, not most of them, just about everything in there does that. So I'm still, you said a lot of things about how you, you envision things, and I think all of those are words that are already in our document. Mm-hmm. So... I think what we're, yeah, I think what we're saying is that we need to emphasize those that we need to that we need to it, well, uh, they're in the document, they were in the document eight years ago, they were in the document fifteen years ago, and yet we still see a project coming that has that does not have continuous lateral access um, so so I think the purpose of the resolution is basically to say. We feel that these policies are relevant, you know, um, and we. This is how we intend to apply them, and and, and they do exist. I mean, they absolutely exist. <clears throat> I, what 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 I've seen has happened is that the focus has been more on creating and manipulating the exemption than and the exceptions rather than the rule. And I think if, if we make it clear that the exemptions and the exceptions are going to be a very, very, very high hurdle to achieve, mm-hmm. I think we're going to get a lot more effort and a lot more creativity in achieving the goals that we're looking yeah. for. And that's also in the code. You know, it right. says it says it it says it has to be infeasible, and you have to have an engineering analysis that comes in and says there are no alternatives that can accomplish. Le-. It doesn't say there are no cheap alternatives. It doesn't say say there are no alternatives that fit with your building. It says there are no alternatives that will, and that's the way we be- have to begin to interpret it. I don't think that's an issue. I mean, I agree with you. I, I mean, I think that's what's supposed to happen. I, I don't know. I, I talked a little bit to the a little bit with the mayor about it. You know where that went, and and that was leaseholder driven, predominantly. I mean, yeah, they could point and say, "Hey, we can't get here. Dynagy's here. We don't have any access to that." Fine. That's one area. And that could be the area where you went out into the into the parking lot if you had to do it, you know. But you still could have had it for the other ones that were there. There was nothing really. There was really nothing that stopped it, and there was no analysis that said you couldn't do it there. Well, and the, but also the other the other issue is you have to connect to existing or potential future lateral access. Dynagy is not going to be there forever. Eventually, something else is going to be built on that site, and it will have lateral access and. If you're next door to it, then you better be ready to hook up. Case in point, Dynergy just announced today that they're exiting, they're leaving the California energy market totally. So so they're not going to be there forever, but it still could be a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. It takes a long view. I mean, this, yeah. is, this takes a long view, but, you know, it, we're... we're I don't think the city is going anywhere real quick. No. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think also it's with the mindset of we have a, we were given a, a, a trust by the State Lands Commission. So the city is given a trust. So working with, you know, with that um, accountability and responsibility, 
caution on the side of um, uh, erring on the side of caution is probably uh, probably behooves us to do that. So I, you know, I, I agree. Almost every, almost everything that we're talking about as an interpretation is 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 in the code, and and that's actually that's actually appropriate. I mean, it's not appropriate for the planning commission to be making new legislation. What we're what we're doing is saying the legislation is there. We're going to pay attention to it. I, well, and and that's what I'm saying. I. I mean, I, I see it all there. I would be requiring these things of any application that came yeah. before us as a result of that. I, we're going to enforce the policies that are there. I, again, as I said before, still don't really understand all the working pieces that went behind that. Let's put it all together and then make findings related to it's infeasible. It just didn't seem to me that that was the case. But, you know, who knows what the you know, the tenor was politically back then, and so that could, you know, have a lot to do with how that happened. And, well, and, and so. I, the, the, the other reason, I think, for a resolution, Scott, is just exactly what you said, that so that when, because we're not going to be here forever, and you're not going to be here forever. You're going to be, you know, uh, president of RRM Design or whoever. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, you know just, just, just so, that we, so that we have it, you know, in writing, you know, how these things are to be dealt with. Okay, so that that was a good statement you just said. So how these things are to be dealt with. So, I mean, are we looking to put more a abbreviated list of these things? I mean, I I'm still I'm still having I'm still struggling a little bit with the policies. I don't see a lot of interpretation things coming from you mm. to me. I see a lot of, hey, we want you to do this. And I'm like, that's what the policy says. <laughs> you know, I, I'm like, I, that's what I'd be doing. And if I didn't, I would think you'd be like, Scott, why aren't you doing that? Uh, so that's. Well, well I think oh, what we're trying to do is, is just lay it out there. This is a resolution that we will be following these guidelines. And it'll be a very, very high hurdle for anyone to get any exemptions. That, you know, because in the past, it looks like there were exemptions given, and a lot yeah. of different, not only on lateral access, but on a lot of, you know. It, maybe not, yeah, maybe not with, we weren't getting the, that, that engineering analysis because I didn't see that in right. the file. Ex for the exactly. And, 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 and it's the our expectation. And the alternatives analysis, I think, is very important. I mean, it's, it, yeah. you know, don't just come and say, well, we can't do it. You know, come and show us the 14 different alternative plans that you analyzed that also were not feasible, you yeah. know. Okay. I, I mean, those, things, those types of things I can, we can, uh, that will bolster what, we're expect, what our expectations are on it. So maybe, and, unless you tell me otherwise, I might focus a little more on the, you know, hey, what are we expecting when people are asking us for exceptions? Um, there seems to be a little more of a, you know, of a pointed discussion with the Planning Commission related to those things. Where, we, where, where you've pointed out, hey, well, I don't like the way this happened or this happened or this happened. We, want it, we expect to see this justification and, uh, and everything that goes along with that. You know, and I, I think, mean, a, well, excuse me, I think a statement, a clear statement that says that if, if the lateral access can't be supplied over the revetment, that it needs to be supplied on the land side, including the fact if you have to remove structures. If you have to remove existing building or structure to supply that, then that's, that, that does not make it infeasible. And S Scott, is there, uh, would, it be, would it be something that we could entertain? It's not only when you're looking at a, a specific lateral access, but then maybe going one or two leases or uh, units over and then just to take a look okay we don't have it here but we have it over here so in the future maybe this will go here so some kind of at least entertaining a vision of within a bigger bite than just a actual lease well it's limited to the lease sites i mean we can't make people do work off of lease sites no. but we can i mean there but the but the requirement i think one of the important things is is that what does that connection look like and when you have the when they have them coming forward saying we can't make it and and uh and church jeff you said this a couple of different times this evening um 
I really think that justification is very important because expensive solutions notwithstanding doesn't necessarily, an expensive solution does not necessarily mean it's infeasible. Um, and you should be looking like if there is actually a situation where you can't connect them right now because there is too much of a grade break, you know, between there, we should be moving this around so it will more easily mash up with there. So we can accommodate that future when this redesigns instead of just, nope, this is the way we have it. We're going to leave it way up here and this one's going to be way down here and then yeah. figure it out. I don't think, I think some of it, some of the onus of making, you know, coming halfway there is on this lease site to get us down a little bit. Um, and looking at what those options are, I, I think there's been a reluctance in the past to sort of do that. They just figured out, oh, we can't do it, you can't get there from here, and tough. I, I think it's, all, oh, it's also very important as we go forward, if you know, there's a lot of leases coming due, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And because the leases don't come here. And how, how do we ensure that in the language of the lease that there is an expectation for lateral access if there's any development. I've had a little bit of an ongoing conversation with Eric Endersby uh, about this, and so those are additional conversations that we... It, I, I would say our system right now, as it, as it relates to the, the lease, is a little bit... Um, well, it's, it's imperfect. When they go to the city council to have their lease agreement okayed, it has the sketch on the back of a napkin. It kind of shows them what it is. And then usually it has language about the improvements are required to put in. And when they go through this process, they're supposed to do them within so long. And then I, I don't think it would, it would hurt if we did include the, the lateral access component in there in some fashion. Um, those things constantly get changed, and then people say, we went to city council, and I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of this in the, in the history of some of the other lease sites. We went to council, and we have our napkin drawing approved, and it doesn't show X, Y, or Z, so we don't have to do it. Uh, and then, you know, everything, the entire time spent at planning commission has been hashing out what they do and don't have to do. Um, as a result of that. So that part I don't like a lot, and it's led to those discussions, and I'm not real interested in having more discussions that are like that. So that is something that, you know, internally we have to, we have to get a grip on. Perhaps so, in our resolution, if it's appropriate, there can be a resolution from this body that we expect that lateral access um, is included in the lease documents. I mean, you can make a recommendation to the city council. The leases are, you know, administered through the city council. So, yeah. Right. Would it, yeah. So, Scott, it seemed to me that one of the fallacies of the uh, Embargadero plan was not having a map of these lateral accesses, not a you know inch you know inch for inch map, but a essentially a. Uh, um, a schematic map showing that these lateral accesses do apply on these lease sites and the connections to the to the to the to the uh, road ends, you know, and also to the existing uh, public uh, viewing areas. So it seems like that would be a you know a graphic you know, um, tool that we could use. And essentially, it could just be a yellow marker down the Embarcadero, you know, on the revetment side, you know, if need be. It's, well, it's easy. Now to, I mean, it's easy to do with aerial photography now. You get aerial photographs of the whole area. And that ends up being clearer than mapping anyhow. I, I like Catherine's idea is that, you know, because it's almost kind of, you know, here we are talking about visions, and it could be circumvented completely. Uh, when it goes to city council, so I think that you know having some resolution and then you know presenting it to the city council and that'll give it a little bit more, you know, like give you that you know some backing too. You know, well, you got the council behind you. You know, we're talking about this and this is important. You can't just just come over here with a napkin and just say I don't need to do it because whatever. You know, so I think that uh, I would like to see a more of a. Cooperation, collaboration, hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. But, the, uh, but the, rea the reality is the city council approves a lease, right? Correct. They're not, they're not approving that napkin drawing when they approve the lease. They're saying, we're going to lease you this piece of property. 
uh, <laughs> oftentimes it's part of the overall package for the lease. It's, I, in my opinion, that's a kind of an odd process because those things get approved here, and I and I and I don't like the way they've been used. And I and I think there's a problem with it. So I mean, it's something that that Eric and I need to kind of work out, you know, between us because it's. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's not really a problem. Maybe it's just some of the folks that have been involved with many of these projects. Maybe it's more of an issue that way. I don't know. It uh, seems it seems to me that it would be appropriate. If, number one, if, it shouldn't be a back of the napkin drawing. It should be, you know, it's a sketch. It should, I, I just we, yeah, but yeah. it should be it should be sufficient to, to, for one to determine what's going to be done there, right? Otherwise, realistically, the council is approving a lease without adequate information as to what they're approving. And it, it also seems to me it would be reasonable for that design to come to the planning commission mm -hmm. before it goes for our, at least for our comments, before it goes to the council. The council obviously would still approve the lease, but it would, we would, we would see that in an advisory capacity and say to the council, you know, you should think about this, this, and this, you know, because that's what we do. We're, you know, we're, we don't wear as many hats. Yeah, I, I think the intent behind it originally was just kind of, hey, this is, in, you know, a rough idea of what we were looking to do. And the council's like, yeah, go ahead and pursue that with the planning commission. I, I think it's been turned around. Maybe that's on the part of the applicants more so than, than internally. It's just... The, uh, the, the discussion I talked about having with, with Eric on this is I've talked to him a couple of different times about it because I'm not in the room when it happens. So, you know, there'll be, you know, discussions that the applicant has with us about, you know, things that took place as part of the lease negotiation and those types of things. And kind of like, well, that's not, you know, where we're going or I have to question it and we have to run it down. So that's what I was talking about it being an imperfect situation because I, we're not getting... I guess perfect information as a result of it. Well, but, but, not, but not only that. I'm, I'm, but not only that. You can't. It doesn't matter. You can't negotiate. I mean, what we're talking about here is code. Okay. Mm -hmm. You you can't negotiate to violate the law. You know, it doesn't matter who's. It, you know, I can't go to the city council and say, you know. I've decided I'd like to grow marijuana in my backyard, and they go, "Okay, go ahead." And I, you know, when the feds come, I go, "Oh no, the council said I, that you can't." So, I mean, if they're talking about things which are violations of the code, it doesn't matter whether it's been quote approved, you know, in these informal discussions or not. Do you know? It, you still got to get your coastal development permit. But the yeah. but the problem has been in the past that it it's. Some of these projects absolutely, you know, have actually come through the planning commission. We've we've conditioned them, rejected the pro, you know, at one point rejected the projects. Uh, they were appealed to the appealed to the city, the council, and the council approved. Well, that's the, that's the well that happens. That's, that's the, the game. Process. Yeah, that's I mean the that's <laughs> there was a different there was a different vision between the planning commission and the council, and that's the you know that's we like I said we didn't get elected so. It's, yeah. you know, <laughs> That's, that's kind of the way it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I guess reeling this back a little bit. Um, I, I think I have a, enough, you know, direction from you to bring back something to you for an interpretation resolution. I kind of get where you're going with this a little bit. And so I'll see if we can't sort of encapsulate all of that. And, uh, and then we'll bring it back and then maybe get, some, get your input, for, you know, on that side of things yeah. one more time. And then maybe we'll finalize it after that. I think it'll yeah. probably take that. I think it'll take you seeing it, us laying it out, you saying, yeah, we want X, Y, Z on top of that and tweak these two and whatever, and then we yeah. should be closer. So does that uh, work for you? I mean, Well, and I don't think, I don't think, Scott, I don't think you should feel that you need not, or that you have to avoid uh, mentioning things that are already in the code, particularly if those things appear to not have been sufficiently emphasized in the, in the past. It, that's what I've taken away from the conversation this evening. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I fully track in that. So, any other? Okay. So we will move on to planning commissioner comments. Is there any any issues to be brought up? Future agenda items? Boy, we're a happy group tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, community development uh, manager comments. Scott, do you have any issues you'd like to bring up? Or? 
Warning. Uh, we're going to be finalizing, well, hopefully, <laughs> the design guidelines in the next city council meeting. <laughs> Great. So it's uh, it's moving forward, and uh, so you'll uh, if you're watching it on TV or what have you, it'll be be heard at the next meeting. So that'll be. Have they have they seen have they had a preliminary uh, review of them, or they're going to do it all in one shot? No, they're going to do it all. Well, they're going to. I mean, like it may not get done in one night. I don't know. It just depends on how much you know they want to delve into it. Um, you know, the good thing is, I think. What was the total? Nine. You guys saw it nine times, so it, it, it definitely is well vetted. So, um, city attorney looked at it and had a couple of comments, and that was about it. Uh, so that was good, and uh, that just happened the other day. So they're finalizing the staff reports for the next for the council packet, and so those will be released coming up here pretty quick. So, great. Now, just to confirm, there is not a meeting, another meeting in July. The next meeting is August, correct? Planning Commission meeting, yes. Okay, correct. thank you. You're correct. Okay. So um, on that note, we will adjourn to our next regular Planning Commission meeting, which will be here at the Veterans Building on August 4th, 2015, at our usual 6 p.m. time. Thank you.